Um, if I stomped a puppy to death out here, up here, just a little puppy, and stomped it right here to death in front of you, most of you would need therapy. And I would be arrested probably faster than killing a black man for killing a puppy. Now, I want you to look at this photo very closely, and I want you to see who's in it. More important than the man hanging, because you've got to understand the lynchings that occurred in America happened after slavery, not during. Thousands of lynchings happened after slavery, because this is a reaction to white fear of what we would do once freed. But we didn't create a vigilante group to take out white people, but they did create a vigilante group to take us out now that we're free. See, that happened after slavery. They were called the what? The Ku Klux Klan. They don't wear hoods anymore. They wear suits. But they're alive and well all over the world, even here. So look at who's in the picture. I want you to put, look at this little girl in particular. You can't see her closely, but she's actually grimacing, like smirking. Now, remember, let's go back to the puppy concept here. She would be loathed and torn up probably if this was a puppy, which means he's less than that because she's not disturbed. This little girl is not, is not disturbed by this, but she should be, shouldn't she? People always ask me, they go, Joy, what was the impact on white people? There it is. Right there. Can't feel any empathy for him. None. Zero zip. There's a little one back here, even smaller. Because whatever she's been taught or told, socialized to believe, makes him no longer human. That's the greatest danger to white people, is that they can't feel it. And there's a reason why white people can't feel what we're talking about. My God, what would you then feel? It's tough. So I've got to believe, oh, it's all over now. It's not my fault. I don't benefit. It's not a big deal. Let's move on. It's not all of those things. But we don't say that to Jewish people. I dare you. But you have to understand, when you unearth this one, that's what we did to our children. So it's, for me, my, my commitment is to healing. So this is not an, an exercise uh, in some kind of broad, intellectual, esoteric. It's really about how do we then take this information and help a person extricate themselves from uh, behavior that they've learned and or been socialized to believe black and white and everyone in, in the middle that has been affected by this. Um, what do we do? So this is kind of looking at the contemporary uh, kind of reflection of the trauma uh, which is white, white supremacy and terrorism, that continues. We, we see that on a daily basis in the United States as well as, as here. Uh, this book is called um, Breaking Rank by Norm Stamper. Norm Stamper is a 34-year police veteran. He was a chief of police for the cities of San Diego and Seattle. This is a white man who wrote this book called Breaking Rank, and he really did. So all I can tell you is he broke rank. I've been trying to meet Norm. Norm travels quite a bit, and he gets a considerable uh, amount of uh, death threats because of what he's done. But he talked about, and this is contemporary. And remember, that's what we're looking at. How does it reflect itself today? I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders, employing an unofficial code for them, NHI, which means no human involved. Now, these are on telephone calls. These are on calls that you hear on police officers speaking. Hey, what do you have? Well, we have a NHI. We have no human involved. It's a black person killed. Do you see what I'm saying? Again, the dehumanization reflecting itself in just their casual involvement with one another. San Diego cops confessed to a myriad other acts of discrimination, including additionally dehumanizing the references to blacks on a radio call, just an 1113 nigger. 1113 is a code for an injured animal. James Madison was a very important figure um, in American history, president of the United States, 1751, 1836. He said, blacks are inhabitants, but as debased by servitude below the equal level of free inhabitants, which regards the slave as divestive two-fifths of the man. This is, the, um, this is called the uh, 
the three-fifths compromise. And what they were trying to figure out uh, is, what are we going to do? How are we going to how are we going to count these these black folks? Because you know, based on how many people you have residing in a particular state, the more representatives you can send send to the House of Representatives, and thus the more power that particular state can wield. So the question was, how do you count the slaves? Well, Southerners who, of course, enjoyed slavery. Uh, they wanted to count them. They said, yeah, count them. That gives us more power. Where the Northerners saw it as an opportunity to abolish slavery, said, well, you can't count them because you don't consider them human. How can you count people who have absolutely no freedom that you do not count or be, treat as human beings? So the agreed upon solution is to count three-fifths of a state's total slave prop, you know, population. And so as a, as a result, they became three-fifths of a man, divested. Of that. But it's almost as though you're not talking about a human being anymore. Again, uh, these folks are held in high regard. When I read about him in your history, one would, you would never know, Google him. You'd never know the ugly trade that he was engaged in because we've sanitized it, you see. It all got kind of sanitized. But what's important is to understand the wealth amassed. And see, this is where people get afraid, particularly Europeans. This is where the whole, oh my God, dare I say the big ugly word, most folks are afraid of, because we don't really care too much about the healing, the healing stuff. Go on and get better, you people. But don't try to touch the resources. That would be reparations. We don't want to have that conversation. We're okay if you all go heal, <laughs> however you're going to do that. But mm, let's not talk about the reparations story. But when you start looking at the wealth amassed, then you've got to look at the Church of England. Hmm. It gets real ugly, because then you start realizing what is a foundation for the Church of England, folks that bless the slave ships. And then, of course, and this is interesting about uh, John Newton, because we all know about, in every, the first thing you hear, John Newton, what's the next thing you hear? Amazing Grace. John Newton, Amazing Grace. Well, let's figure out what happened before he got Amazing Grace. He said slaves are lesser creatures without Christian souls and thus are not destined for the next world. Now what becomes important about this kind, and you'll see it both in American history as well, it, there is this kind of dehumanization of African people. Because you've got to ask yourself this question, how do people who deem themselves superior, who see themselves as the civilizers, who recognize themselves as the what we call manifest destiny, the white man's burden of civilizing all the rest of the, the races. How do you reconcile being the superior being and engaging in barbaric behavior? What that produces is something called cognitive dissonance. How many people are familiar with that? Cognitive dissonance is really thinking discord. It's when you begin to feel conflict between what you believe or understand or hold to be true, and you are then faced with behaviors, either in yourself or others, that conflict with your fundamental belief. It produces cognitive dissonance. Human beings don't function well with cognitive dissonance. You must remove the cognitive dissonance in order to function. So in order for people to perpetuate slavery, and to perpetuate that whole system that lasts for centuries, you had to remove all dissonance associated with it. Can't be anything wrong with me. Certainly isn't us. We're the civilizers. We're the superior. So it must be them. Oh, yes. Well, you see, they don't even have souls. Now I can go to sleep because I'm not really dealing with a human being. Are you following me? OK, let's see what else he said. He said, when the women and girls are taken on board a ship naked, trembling, terrified, they are often exposed to the wanton rudeness of white savages. The prey is divided upon the spot. Look at the choice of words, the prey. Resistance or refusal would be utterly in vain. And then he says, I sinned with a high hand. Yeah, and then he wrote Amazing Grace. Then you have science. And whenever we are in a process of trying to legitimize things, it's so amazing. You know, people always say this to me, even black people, when they hear about post-traumatic. Because you know it's not correct unless you can count it and measure it, right? Science is the, the final. It is the number one. 
If you can say it's scientific, then you basically trump everything else, right? Science determines reality. So if we can scientifically assert a thing to be true, then in fact it is true because it's scientifically proven. It's a scientific fact. Matter of fact, that's what people will tell you when you, when you try to say to them, I don't know if I agree with you. You know, it's scientific. It's a scientific fact, what I'm saying here, right? Which somehow makes it what? True. And it's also in a book. Now let's do the math. It's in a book, and it's scientifically proven. Did anybody here realize that recently we lost a planet? Can anybody know what planet we lost? How you lose a planet? So let's go to science. And I think it's important that we do. So we then, again, we go to someone named Carl von Linnaeus. Now, Carl von Linnaeus becomes an important character in this whole conspiracy of silence and legitimacy and removing the dissonance. Carl von Linnaeus developed a system based on a criterion of skin color and laid the basis for 19th century racial classification Linnaeus properly began the science of anthropology. So here we have the father of anthropology. Although color classification of races dated back to the ancient Egyptians, anthropologists refer to Linnaeus' Systema Natura of 1735 as the first modern study of man. While Linnaeus advanced classification with his use of a color criterion, he also fixed on his four families of man certain moral and intellectual peculiarities that continued into the 19th century anthropological vocabulary. He described Homo Americanus. Who might that be? That would be Native Americans, American Indians. Homo Americanus, and what did he say about them? He said they were reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and regulated by custom. Homo Europaeus, as white, fickle, sanguine, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by laws. Homo Asiaticus, that'd be Asians, as sallow, grave, dignified, avaricious, and ruled by opinions and homo affer, as black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. These insights into what Linnaeus defined as racial character, personality traits, behavior, intelligence, language, and a host of other related categories were transmitted into subsequent attempts at a science of classification and became more fixed than the races themselves. Not a shred of science here. But do you not hear these same attributions today? You know those blacks, they're lazy, you know, all of the exact same, am I telling the truth? In your newspapers, in your accounts of them, do you not hear these very same things? So does it matter that it started in 1707 and 1778 and has no scientific merit? That's multi-generational, is it not? Johann uh, Friedrich Blumenbach, he was an individual. How many of you are familiar with the term Caucasian? Oh, yes. <laughs> then you know Johann. He would designate five races or varieties of man in the, session, in the second edition of his work on the natural variety of mankind. His division into Caucasian, Mongolian, American, Ethiopian, and Malayan races with the added Carl von Linnaeus descriptive peculiarities, became the subsequent basis of most 19th century anthropomedical studies. While Carl von Linnaeus founded his system principally upon skin color, Blumenbach considered a combination of color, hair, skull, and facial characteristics as fundamental means for classifying the five varieties of man. Central to his study was the Caucasian, a term which he originated. He took the name Caucasian, listen for the science, from Mount Caucasus because its southern slope had cradled what he felt to be the most beautiful race of men, the Georgian. The Caucasus near Mount Ararat, upon which the biblical ark came to rest after the flood, seemed the appropriate source for the original race of man. No science yet. 
Now I'm going to quote him. These are his words. For in the first place, the stock displays, as we have seen, the most beautiful form of the skull, from which is a mean and primeval type, the others diverge by most easy gradations on both sides, the two ultimate extremes. That is, on the one side, the Mongolian, on the other, the Ethiopian. Besides, it is white in color. Anybody here ever met a skull that wasn't? Besides, it is white in color, which we may fairly assume to have been the primitive color of mankind. zippity doo da no science, nothing to found this whole thing. He figured white skull, humanity began white. Thomas Jefferson, you all know him? Yes, he's one of my favorite people, actually. I close out my book with a soliloquy from Thomas Jefferson. I actually end my book with it. Because Thomas Jefferson made a statement. Here's a man highly regarded in the United States. I mean, there are more statues of him than probably anybody. And he made a statement towards the end of his life. He says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You see, it haunted him to his grave. Because Thomas Jefferson knew he knew what would happen. Matter of fact, he predicted exactly what we're dealing with today, what happened between people of African descent and those of European descent. Predicted it. He was a bright man. How do you reconcile behaving in such a barbaric way? Well, let's see what he said. He said uh, blacks smelled bad and were physically unattractive. Well, this was inconsistent with his behavior because, you know, he fathered Slaves, Sally Hemings. So it didn't smell that bad, huh? <laughs> now here's a more important one. He said we required less sleep. Now that one's more interesting to me. Why would he need to, what dissonance was he feeling that he would need to believe that blacks required less sleep? Why? What did he do? You know, he owned slaves. So what do you think, how hard do you think he worked them? What was the work day for a slave? Sunrise to sunset. But do you have any empirical evidence, George? Can you prove that? Because you know, can't, if, if you can't write, you know, count it and measure it, it didn't happen in European culture. Is that correct? You've got to count it and measure it. How many of you have measurable objectives? Measurable outcomes, you better measure it. I don't care if you tell them. Can you tell your boss, really, truly, at the end of the year, we're doing better now? I've been to work every single day I've watched, and I can guarantee you we're doing better. Is that going to fly? <laughs> that would be no. That means you have to count it and measure it. And if you didn't count and measure, it didn't happen. So when you start looking at the notion of requiring less sleep, that's an interesting thing, because I have to believe if I work you that hard. And boy, I, I got humbled when I found out how hard folks worked in the sugar plantations. Ooh wee, I got humbled by how hard folks in the Caribbean were worked. But what I decided to do is I looked at the Library of Congress. Most of my work over the nine years that it took to write the book, six years of that was research. The other part of it had to do with doing um, interviews of elders and reading slave narratives. And there are thousands of them. This is just one taken from the Library of Congress. Sarah Gudger from North Carolina wrote, never know nothing but work, never knew rest, felt like my back was going to break. This is the gospel truth. Then I looked at uh, what happened in the sugar plantations. And this was amazing. One final set of grim numbers underlines the way slaves on sugar plantations like Codrington, uh, with the plantation of Barbados, were systematically worked to an early death. When slavery ended in the United States, slaves imported over the centuries had grown to a population of nearly 4 million. When it ended in the British West Indies, total slave imports of well over 2 million left a surviving slave population of only about 670,000. More than twice as many slaves were shipped to the island of Jamaica alone than all 13 uh, North American colonies combined, the Caribbean was a slaughterhouse. In fact, the reason why there was more importation of slaves to these plantations is because they died so frequently. They were treated so badly, ate so poorly, that females never reached their menstrual cycle. They never actually started their menstrual cycles, so they couldn't reproduce, you see. And so many of them died, they had to import more. 
That's how treacherous was, you lazy black folks that you are. Isn't that ironic, though? What's so ironic is black people run from the shame of feeling like they're perceived as lazy. I, I mean, I live with that so much that when I would go to hotels, I would leave it cleaner. Because <laughs> your mother, everybody's mother taught you, leave it cleaner than you found it. So black folks are so hypersensitive, I was cleaning up the hotel room. Because I wouldn't want anyone to think I'm dirty. Right? Now, all the people in the audience that are of color, how much harder did your parents tell you you had to work to get to even? How much harder? You had to work twice as hard. Now, how come I knew that about you? How come I knew that? Think about it. And yet, at the same time, white people think we're lazy, you see? But we're so hypersensitive because of the shame, right? And then our ancestors will work to death, to death. Recently, they unearthed the slave cemetery. They unearthed actually a slave in, uh, cemetery in um, New York City. It's on Wall Street, by the way, in the shadow of the bull. Unearthed the slave cemetery. And they still, to this day, they're struggling. They recently you know, have done a lot in terms of commemoration. I went to the, it took me everything to get to it. They had it blocked off so you couldn't get to it. But they, because they didn't want to deal with it. You know, you can't just bulldoze a cemetery. So here in all these skyscrapers in the middle of it is this little cemetery. And there are slaves in that cemetery. More important than that was what the bones told us. Because you know, now you know you got CSI. <laughs> Hell, I can go in there and tell you what's going on now. <laughs> you know, so with the CSI thing, now I, you know, they they've discovered a little bit about the bones. And to me, the most phenomenal thing about the bones is what they told us about those people and how they live. Majority of the people in there were children. Infants and children, high mortality, infant mortality rate. They even know what they died of. Died of uh, malnutrition and starvation, because they could tell by the rotting of the teeth in the jawline. So even though they most likely grew food, they weren't allowed to eat it. And then they found something even more peculiar that speaks to this idea of why he believed we required less sleep. They would show a large frame man and they would find an injury where the muscle actually detached itself from the bone as a result of exertion and not injury. Stay with me. It, it detaches itself from the bone as a result of exertion. That means you work so hard, the muscle detached itself from the bone. You don't see those kind of injuries in contemporary society because no one's going to work that hard. Unless, of course, you have a gun trained on you from sunrise to sunset. So we do have empirical evidence of how hard folks work. Then he went on to say that we were dumb, cowardly, and incapable of feeling grief. Why would Thomas Jefferson need to believe that? Why would he need to believe we didn't feel grief? What was he doing, do you think, that produced cognitive dissonance? You were killing people, not only were you killing people, beating them, you were selling them, yes? Selling mothers away from their children and husbands away from wives. And surely they don't feel it, because if they felt it, that would make them human like me. Then there was J. Marion Sims. I won't spend a lot of time with him. He's another figure. You can Google him. He's a, there's a statue, actually, of him in Central Park. And J. Marion Sims was an individual credited. He was a father of uh, modern gynecology. How many women in here know what a vaginal speculum is? And for those men in the room that we lost, <laughs> a vaginal speculum is a device designed to open up the vagina. It was considered uh, one of the most important advancements in medicine uh, that was made. He was credited as being the wealthiest man uh, to have, wealthiest physician to have ever lived. And what's interesting about him, you know, look at the medals pinned on him. I was just very curious about how it was uh, they regarded this man, because no one ever really looked at how did he come up with that vaginal speculum. The way he did it was he, he actually uh, worked on unanesthetized, created, did experiments on unanesthetized slave women. He created a, a makeshift hospital in his backyard in the mid-1800s. He built the first vaginal speculum from a pewter spoon. 
And he reasoned that slave women were able to bear great pain, meaning we don't need any anesthesia, because their race made them more durable and thus they were well suited for painful medical experimentation. We didn't even, you know, because we didn't feel like other women could feel. This man would cut into women, cut into them, and just said, well, since they're black, they don't really feel it. Unbelievable. And more importantly is what he did to infants. Because not only did he experiment on women, he also experimented on infants. He said that black infants suffered from something he called trimus nascentium, which is now commonly referred to as neonatal tetanus. Neonatal tetanus originates in horse manure, which was a likely cause of the disease in slave infants. He, contrib he attributed it to the indecency and intellectual flaws of slave infants together with skull malformations at birth. Um, that is a shoemaker's all. And that's the 1800s shoemaker's all. He would stick that into the heads of brand new infants in an effort to realign their skulls based on the indecency and intellectual flaws of their parents to treat the malady. Of course, it was a 100% death rate. But that's what he would stick in the head of a baby at birth. No white could ever rape a slave woman. The regulations of law as to the white race on the subject of sexual intercourse do not and cannot, for obvious reasons, apply to slaves. Their intercourse is promiscuous. We've now justified raping black women because they can't be raped. They, we aren't raping them. They're promiscuous. The fact that white men could profit from raping their female slaves does not mean that their motive was economic. The rape of slave women by their masters was primarily a weapon of terror that reinforced whites' domination over their human property. Rape was an act of physical violence designed to stifle black women's will to resist and to remind them of their servile status. These become important instruments that you look at. And I want to give you some statistics as it relates to American history. By the mid-1800s, there was over 600,000 mixed-race children born. 600,000. How many of you know what um, miscegenation is? Miscegenation is the illegal marriage between people of different races. Actually, it was very profound here. That it was illegal to marry someone of another race. So when you consider the fact that one of the greatest issues and one of the number one reasons why black men were lynched, beaten, and imprisoned had to do with the fear that they were going to rape whom? White women. Casual Killing Act was written uh, because of the number of people who were killed by, while being corrected. Okay. And if any slave resists his master, owner, or other person by his or her order, correcting such slave and shall happen to be killed in such correction, it shall not be counted felony, but the master, owner, and every other person so giving correction shall be acquitted of all punishment and accusation for the same as if such accident had never happened. Then you had the mental health folks. This is how we got in. We got in to try to fix it. In the early years of the 19th century, a physician named Samuel A. Cartwright argued that two particular forms of mental illness caused by nerve disorders were prevalent among slaves. One was drapedomania, which was diagnosable by a single symptom, the uncontrollable urge to escape from slavery. <laughs> so now what we've done is we've now pathologized your desire to be free. 